Okay, everybody, welcome to the Starving Podcast. This is your host, Justin Romer. I'm going to go through some of our sponsors. Our first sponsor is Geno Palette. They're a DNA company that essentially analyzes your genes and tells you how you should be eating. So if you're looking to find out if you're carb sensitive or how you metabolize carbohydrates, maybe you're gluten sensitive or have deficiencies in certain vitamins, go to the link in our bio and get $20 off your first Geno Palette report. Our second sponsor is X Endurance. X Endurance is a third party tested supplement company. They have everything you might need your protein, creatine, vitamin D, everything for a healthy immune system, which we know uh, how important that is in a pandemic like this. Our third sponsor is Performance Sleep. This is the most comfortable bed I've ever slept on, and their prices are extremely, extremely affordable. They have everything from the single all the way to the California King. So head over to their website or the link in our bio and get $75 off your order order with code CBG75. Our fourth sponsor is Dad Bod Fitness Online. They're offering an elegant solution, especially at a time where the fitness industry is constantly evolving and changing. They've adapted to offer a great online programming for moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, whoever wants to stay fit and work out from home. So go ahead and check out their website through the link in our bio. Our fifth sponsor is Consistency Breeds Growth. This is a customized performance nutrition company. Their goal is to make it feel like an all-inclusive resort when you work with one of their coaches. They try to give as much individualization as possible. They have some of the best coaches from some of the best universities in the world with great backgrounds, nutrition, performance, and even working with high-level athletes. So if you're looking to work with one of their coaches, head over to consistencybreedsgrowth.com and sign up to to chat with any of the coaches that they have on their staff. So today we're going to be talking specifically about genetics and how they relate to your nutritional profile. We feel that this is truly the future of nutrition and customized nutrition for performance, weight loss, you name it. We have an expert coach on today with us, Justina, and she's going to chat with us about all of these different and variety of topics. So please stay tuned. It's science. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Starving Podcast. This is your host, Justin. Today, we have a special guest, Justina DePuzo. She is a science lover since she was a kid. Uh, She wants to know specifically how our DNA interact with the environment, our physiology, and the foods that we consume. She has her bachelor's degree in biology from Arcadia University and a master's degree in molecular nutrition sciences from Syracuse University. So she's going to be talking with us today about a variety of topics. Justina, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Great to have you on. I feel like this is one conversation of many uh, speaking about genetics and nutrition uh, going forward. Oh, yeah. It's, a, it's definitely an emerging topic, and we obviously uh, at Consistency Breeds Growth want to use as much individualization in the process as possible. And of course, an athlete-centric approach and learning as much about your client to be able to do that based on their schedule and what foods they like and don't like and what upsets their stomachs and other things is, is, um, is slowly starting to become the norm for, for most coaches and companies. So there must be a way to use even more individualization you know, based on the science that's coming out. Yeah, so that's pretty much my approach as well. I try and make it more customized to the specific individual, more in a scientific way. So what I do is I just try and keep up to date with the scientific literature off of even just PubMed or sometimes Google Scholar. And you'll find that research in nutrition sciences and in nutrition coaching is constantly evolving. So we have to somehow find a new way to customize these plans for all of the different individuals that we have. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I resonate with that completely. I think that, um, you know, people that have had a lot of struggles, um, you know, with their nutrition and long-term weight loss should really look mm-hmm. into, you know, a customized approach. Now, if you're eating complete trash, right, then mm-hmm. there's sort of an underlying issue uh, regarding what you should be doing and how you should be doing it just based on the calorie, you know? Right. 
So like at CBG, we obviously focus on calories in, calories out, and we don't even worry about, um, you know, anything else regarding the genetics of nutrition until we have a very sound foundation of sleep, hydration, uh, movement, and Mm -hmm. a caloric deficit if weight loss at the end of the day is the person's goal. But once we get to those different steps, there may be an expedited way through someone's genetics um, and the foods that they eat and how much of different macronutrients, and by macronutrients, I mean protein, carbs, and fat, and even micronutrients that people mm-hmm. might be eating, you know? Yeah. So I honestly think that is the future of nutrition coaching and just overall health for everyone. Um But one of the issues is how quick can we get that information from our genetics and our DNA? So I feel like that's the next step in science is to pretty much how to make that readily available for everyone to make themselves have a healthier lifestyle. Right. No, this is a good point. So we we actually have a sponsor uh, for the podcast and through our nutrition company called Geno Palette. And Mm -hmm. they specifically will... Uh, tell you based on genotyping and I guess we'll get into a little bit about what that actually is but uh, based on genotyping they can tell you what genes you have and the prevalence of those genes and that can tell you a lot of information about uh, you know whether for example you metabolize protein very well or you metabolize fat well or if you're you might be deficient in a particular vitamin for example The problem with this is that it actually takes some time to get the data back. So a lot of people that want to work with us through Consistency Breeds Growth, they have trouble, um, you know, signing up for the Genopal data, waiting for that data, and then getting that information. So obviously there's a way to customize before that time until the data comes in. But I'd like to go into a little bit about... um, you know, what your research was when you were in graduate school, because you did research specifically on genetics and how, um, you know, wh- how has that research impacted the way that you work with people for health and then also for performance? Right. So my research in at Syracuse was essentially just how our epigenome specifically, so our epigenetics, which is above the genome, how that can be altered through our environment. So what I mean by environment is what we consume, but also what we just simply live in. So specifically, I looked at the associations of urinary BPA levels and dietary fat intake with prior breast cancer diagnosis among women. So what I did was I used data from one point in time, so a cross-sectional study that just looked at data from women 30 years or older and looked at their BPA levels in their urine. So that essentially means if something is in your urine, that's spillover. So you have too much in your system that your system can either consume, but we don't want to consume and utilize BPA because that's bad, or just we can't really do anything with it, so our urine excretes it. And usually what happens is if we have BPA in our system, it's an endocrine-disrupting hormone that takes a very similar structural level to estrogens. So I chose this molecule because it's very similar to the estrogen molecule in females and males, but mostly females. And what happens essentially is if we have a a diet high in saturated fat, we also have more BPA that's getting stored in our adipose tissue, which increases the risk to cancers and hormonal cancers like breast cancer. So I pretty much just use the information and these approaches from my research in nutrition coaching based off of the fact that I need to keep in mind, everyone should keep in mind that we need balance and moderation within our systems and less processed foods so we don't get these chemicals into our body that could alter our health as well as our performance. Yeah, that's excellent. So for those of you that don't know what BPA is, this is bisphenol A. This is commonly found in a lot of processed food, especially like different plastics. I know that a lot of women uh, specifically that are um, pregnant or breastfeeding like to stay away from plastic bottles and other things just because in utero or, you know, when they're breastfeeding, you know, bisphenol A 
is, as you said, fat soluble and can get in fatty tissue such as breast mm -hmm. tissue, for example, uh, right. where women are breastfeeding. So if you're taking in a lot of processed foods that have a lot of bisphenol A, you're saying that this could potentially epigenetically, which is the alteration of our genes based on our environment, mm -hmm. affect the rate at which women are getting a variety of cancer, specifically in this case, you, you examine yeah. that of breast cancer. Right. Wow. So essentially the epigenetic modifications, all of those include hypomethylation. So when we look at our DNA, certain genes are protected so they can't be expressed in our system. So a lot of these tumor genes that could increase tumor growth in our bodies, they're protected so they don't get expressed and then form tumors. But what happens is if we have sometimes if we have high saturated fat and high levels of BPA in our system, those genes become hypomethylated, so less methylated with methyl groups. So now they're able to express and form tumors, hence cancer. Right. Wow, that's really insightful. I know that, um, you know, we've heard everything uh, over the last 50 years about uh, what, you know, different types of fats are bad and good and um, you know, carbohydrates are bad and then protein's bad because it affects your kidneys, all this stuff, you know, right. and we're obviously uh, pinpointing down to the calorie. And I know that uh, specifically, you know, over the last five years or so, people have, um, you know, went away from the hypothesis that saturated fat is bad. Mm -hmm. they, they, they've obviously going to a more moderate approach instead of uh, mm -hmm. you can never have saturated fat. So saturated right. fats typically in like... Uh, butters, uh, egg yolks, things like that. There is some saturated fat in nuts and seeds, but they're mostly complies, uh, comprised of monounsaturated fats. But it seems like the combination of the saturated fat in some regard with uh, the BPA um, right. is you know, uh, an issue. Now, did right. you guys run any control studies where saturated fat was inherently low and BPA was high? Um, we unfortunately couldn't do that because my program was only two years, yeah. so we couldn't really go too much into detail with those specifics. But what we did do was we took a control group of just females who were not diagnosed with breast cancer, and then we looked at the differences between the BPA and saturated fat levels. And specifically, we looked at the fatty acid ratio, so saturated fats to mono and polyunsaturated fats. Mm -hmm. And pretty much what we did see was there was a link, the only link we saw, because it was a short study, so we couldn't go into as much detail as we wanted to, there was a link that we saw that the females that were five years out from being diagnosed with breast cancer, they changed their dietary habits and now their saturated fat intake, their saturated fat levels as well as BPA levels are lower in their body. So that kind of shows support for dietary modifications do aid in an increase in overall health. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, very uh, people don't understand the different variables in regards to nutrition. So right. I think that it's an, it's important to gather a variety of studies and make conclusions. And I think that's why scientists have been wrong, especially um, you know scientists involved in doing studies on nutrition, because right. the the rivers and valleys of the variables that can be changed from one person to another. Mm -hmm. is uh is extremely it, it's crazy i mean you have like obviously you have just don't even think about the fact that there's saturated fat in this study but you have variety of women's uh women that have that are at different ages right and you try right. to control for a lot of these things um exactly as much as you can right but you can't really control for everything um and then there's their own genetic profile so like obviously mm -hmm. we know that there's a genetic component linked to breast cancer the BRCA gene for example is something that you can um, find out if you have specifically right. through, if you go through 23 me in your ancestry and you, you, mm -hmm. you, um, you get the health report, you can find out if you have this BRCA gene. And then you also have, which is your study specifically trying to understand the epigenetics, which is the change in your genes over time, uh, through mm -hmm. the methylation of DNA and that expression and how it relates to that of, of breast cancer with its involvement, uh, of saturated 
fat found in the blood. Um, but obviously, like, you also have what was the dietary protein that the women were taking in. How many yeah. carbohydrates were they taking in? Were they right. overweight? Were they underweight? Uh, were they training uh, specifically? How much were they training? Were they doing weight training? Were they doing cardio? Um, right. Were they in an area uh, that, you know, th- there are a lot of, of people now that are in specific areas that have high levels of radiation versus others. So, like, right. to understand, um, you know, when someone links one study, it's uh, it's extremely difficult to take that study and say, oh, my God, like, you know, if you have all these factors, you're 30, you're eating high saturated fat and all these different things, you make a specific conclusion. I think as scientists, we know that, but other people don't. And obviously, like, the study that you performed is is incredible. It's great, but you know that you don't just take your study and not look at other studies to come to specific exactly. conclusions, you know? And what you also have to remember, not even just as a scientist, but as someone who is... I guess, curious about sciences and using these articles and research to benefit their own lives, you have to remember that these studies, you need to hit a certain sample size in order to somehow figure out a a statistical significance or not. So you need to have a certain number of each sample within your study to get some sort of statistical analysis. Right. Yeah, I mean, there are so many different types of studies. Like you said, you have the crossover study, you have meta-analysis, yeah. you have uh, a lot of nutrition studies these days are um, totally survey-based. So right. like, it becomes extremely difficult. And, um, you know, obviously we continue to try to inform. Um, and, th- no, thanks for sharing your research. That That's, uh, that's awesome. I definitely want to go a little bit more into what – specifically are our genes and our DNA like what is DNA and yeah um you know as you already mentioned sort of how it's altered by the environment but are there other things in the environment that affect our DNA yeah so pretty much a lot of things affect our DNA almost everything which is scary to think about but um DNA it simply just stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid so it's pretty much a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base that are connected and intertwined into this double helix form that is known as our human genome. And our genes are within our DNA. So every three nitrogenous bases make a gene. And they code for, well, they specifically code for an amino acid, which then becomes a protein. And that protein is the gene that gets expressed into something. So like even hair color or how we process our carbs. Those are both just proteins, different proteins that are expressed in different ways. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. Um, And, you know, DNA, obviously, you know, as you mentioned, is genetic material. It it carries a certain specific set of instructions, um, which eventually encode different proteins, which are dispersed throughout our body and and give us um, our characteristics, the way Mm -hmm. that we move, how we see, how we uh, do a variety of different activities. And um, yeah, I think that that gives a really great definition of how working proteins uh, do most of the work in your cells. They're responsible for function of body tissues, organs, and how the body processes food. Right. Right. And it's, It's crazy because like you need all these macronutrients and micronutrients in order for these proteins to work properly. So not only do we need to consume protein for our muscle growth and repair, we need to consume proteins and amino acids for our DNA. Yeah. (laughs) And people sometimes I think forget about that as well. (laughs) Yeah, I think that that it becomes uh, increasingly important to make sure that in this case, um, you know, vegetarians and vegans, that they're getting Mm -hmm. enough protein and enough leucine, uh, specifically leucine content to make sure that they're not only building and repairing muscle, but, um, you know, also giving the proper amount of protein for instructions uh, towards DNA and replication and all of these these other processes. And this is why, in, in my personal opinion, if I had to pick one macronutrient, protein, carbs, and fat, it's obviously uh-huh. different for different people. Protein is the most important. 
Absolutely. Um, yeah, and getting enough protein um, is vital. Um, right. For success in anything, I believe that you're doing, yeah. which is weight loss, recovery, performance. Um, yeah. So specifically, um, you said they have these genes and they can be altered, and this is how our uh, our epigenetics and our DNA change over time. Um, I'd like to go specifically into some of the genes uh, that we are born with specifically, yeah, and how they may. Um, you know, give us information about how we should be dieting and what foods that we should specifically be taking in. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know that, um, for example, like, uh, people that, uh, you know, that need a high protein count because they don't metabolize protein as well as others, uh, have genes like FTO and DH. CR7. These are genes, right? And they mm -hmm. have a prevalence of specific, um, uh, essentially, uh, yeah, g genotype and their prevalence, which will tell us information about how much of a specific macronutrient. And these genes are related to that are protein. So this is something that is available and it's not that expensive. Like from Genopallet, mm -hmm. for like 150 bucks, you can get all of the genotyping data you want. Now, it doesn't tell you all of your genes, you know, um, mm -hmm. that you have. This would be um, DNA sequencing, right? Right, right. And this is extremely expens expensive um, to get your entire genome um, printed out and mapped out. And maybe we're headed there in the future. I think DNA sequencing actually won the Nobel Prize. Do you know about this? When did they win? I don't know. I thought the DNA sequencing won several I mean, years ago, but... <laughs> I feel like they should have because it's an important topic, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, I feel like they did, but but basically they, they've been able to map out the entire entire genome. Now, yeah. that's not what you're going to get when you go to uh, a DNA company and you provide your DNA either through saliva or blood, but you are going to get specific genotypes and the, pre the prevalence of... Uh, specific genes and the prevalence mm -hmm. of the genotype. Um, and this could give a lot of information. Uh, for example, a lot of people out there actually think that they are carb sensitive. They think that they cannot tolerate carbs very well. They could be correct, right? right. Uh, because right. people do metabolize different, um, you know, based on how much insulin secreted potentially exactly. and, all, and how much working out they're doing, which is more of an epigenetic issue. Mm -hmm. Um, they may not metabolize carbs as well as someone else. And this could be based off of the genes they were born with, which was passed down from, you know, several ancestors, let's say. Right. Um, and you can determine whether you need a high carbohydrate or a low carbohydrate diet and how even, let's say for a performance athlete, how you can use your carbohydrate amount and optimize it for, mm -hmm. you know, what you want to do, whether that's CrossFit or mixed martial arts or marathon running. Um, there are ways to do this. And I find it extremely fascinating that now this is available, but you know, you're a lot of coaches out there are not going to be able to understand, um, this information. Like if you're just giving macros to someone and you know you're not evolving with what's happening in terms of right. of customization it's going to be really difficult and i think that we we talked about this in the beginning um that if you're a coach out there and you are restricting your clients all of your clients to a specific diet like let's mm -hmm. say you're a keto coach you're not just only behind anymore you're going to be completely and utterly obsolete within the next five years. That's my personal opinion because I agree. You're not only, yeah, go, go ahead, Justina. I know you're, oh. <laughs> you're, you're, fuming, you're ready to go. Yeah. Well, I just from a scientific standpoint and just a, I don't want to say a medical standpoint, but a holistic standpoint, if we're trying to optimize these clients lives and have them be happy with, how they feel in their own skin, how they look, how they perform, all of this, we need to make sure that we individualize it to them. So if we're just trying to give keto to someone who can't process these fats, 
that's not good and it's not healthy either. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for keto specifically, I mean, not only like, okay, so let's say you're, you're a coach, uh, nutrition coach, mm -hmm. you're restricting uh, ice cream from someone. Okay, fine. You restrict a specific food that we know uh, in excess in a caloric deficit can uh, cause weight gain, eventually lead to potential comorbidities. Awesome. Right. Right. But once you start restricting entire an entire macronutrient, in this case with keto, you're not only you're restricting carbohydrates almost completely, but you're right. also restricting protein because um, once you have too much protein, you can get kicked out of uh, ketosis uh, quite easily. Right. Um, so, uh, because it does cause, uh, an insulin response to some degree. So like you're severely restricting someone's food composition. So if you are doing that, do you honestly think that they're going to be able to follow a keto diet for an extended period of time? And even if they only follow it for six months and they're not getting these other, ma we already talked about how important protein is for DNA. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And it's not to say that there aren't other metabolic processes that can convert fat into protein and, and stuff like that. But, yeah. I mean, it's still, um, it, it becomes extremely difficult, not only from uh, a health and performance standpoint, but from a longevity and adherence mm -hmm. standpoint to help someone uh, if you restrict them so much. Right. And we also have to remember that if we, let's say I'm on a keto diet and I'm consuming barely any carbs, mostly fat and a little less protein, in order to have our the fat that we're consuming get converted into the carbohydrates that our organs need and the proteins that our DNA and organs need, the byproduct of that fat gets sent to our brain and to, for our brain to use as energy and our brain does not like that it prefers carbohydrates and that can eventually lead to just organ damage. Yeah. That, yeah. That's super interesting. Cause I know, you know, there are metabolic processes that, um, you know, and yeah, as you mentioned, like the brain blood glucose mm -hmm. and glucose is, uh, and fructose specifically are, are great mm -hmm. sources to fuel the brain. And, uh, once you go into a state where you have a lack of carbohydrate or you're doing carbohydrate restriction, your body can essentially start using fat uh, to, um, you know, fuel thoughts and brain function and, right. and things like that. And I wonder, uh, you know, when studies will come out that, uh, you know, peop there, there's some potential um, through exhaustive and chronic, uh, you know, keto use and using the keto mm -hmm. diet affect, you um, brain derived neurotrophic factor and uh other um you know things that might contribute to uh long term health issues in regards to neurological disease. Uh I don't know the research on that. I don't know if yeah. it's coming out. But it'd be interesting to study um because some people do love the keto diet and there are right. some some uh some great things that uh result from it. Uh, specific, specifically fat metabolism uh, can be drastically adapted and improved during that process. But you have to realize that that's coming at a cost right. uh, to some other things. And we've already explained some of those costs, but there could be long-term, obviously, effects to this. And I think it's extremely difficult to do studies this long, like to get the funding for like a study that's like 40 years long um, yeah. is unbelievably difficult. And what's also difficult is just your sample. You have to make sure that you give them enough incentive to continue your study for you. Right. Yeah. Just from a monetary perspective, yeah. and making money for funding, like who's going to fund that? It's insanely right. expensive. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy that for research, that's what it all trickles down to is just how much you can afford in order to get your study out there and the information that is pretty essential nowadays. Right. Yeah. Especially when it comes to life and death and right. the immune system. And obviously we know how important the immune system is currently, especially with yeah. the pandemic going on. Like, um, that, that's also some other genes from the genopallet data, 
Um, mm-hmm. You can find out if you're particularly uh, absorbing vitamin A at the same rate as you know uh, an average an average person. Um, and whether you might need to incorporate other foods high in vitamin A or vitamin C, which are protective against the immune system, and vitamin D, which are protective against the immune system. Mm-hmm. Um, if you know your your report or your DNA might say, look, buddy, you don't absorb vitamin D well. Like you need to be taking in foods that are high in vitamin D uh, at higher milligram amounts per 100 grams than someone that may be uh, absorbing vitamin D extremely well, right? Right. And you're not going to know that based off of how you feel. You're not going to be like, oh, I feel so good today based Mm -hmm. off of what I eat. I'm going to keep eating the same. Like, No, your immune system and function is going to be down. You might get sick a little bit more often than someone. And right now, I'm not trying to take a chance at getting sick. Mm -hmm. Um, So they're they're not only for the performance side and stuff in terms of protein metabolism carbohydrate metabolism from the dna data that we're describing but also from a health perspective and i think that there's two sides because health and performance are not the same right um so i think that that's also extremely useful information um and i think this is a good time for us to talk a little bit about we have the genes that we're born with, right? We've explained yep. this. And we also have the genes that are altered over time, what they're called our epigenetics. Um, and I think that the intertwining these two uh, and building a customized diet, if any coach out there can do that, they've hit the lottery. Right. Am I? That's opinion. like the gold standard for nutrition coaching, in my opinion. So I think it's going to be challenging to do, but I think it is possible once we find a quicker way to get our genetic reports out to clients or just simply how we determine, okay, well, our epigenome has this effect when we consume A, B, and C, and this is what it does to our genes that we're born with. Once we figure out how all of those affect each other, that's when we when we hit that gold standard nutrition plan for each individual. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think that, um, yeah, I'd like to know a little bit more about the process of how we determine, like I know how we determine our DNA that we're born with. We talk right. about the genotyping and, um, you know, DNA sequencing to learn your whole genome. Can you also take someone's whole genome and understand their epigenetic profile? So pretty much, yeah, because when we have our entire genome, let's say we print it out on a paper, that's going to be like a million pages, but each, (laughs) each letter of those bases, those are called like one single base change it's called a polymorphism, so a single nucleotide polymorphism. Once we see all of these changes in someone's genome, we're then able to know the effect that it has on the epigenome. Yeah, that's super interesting. So like A, T, G, C, U, right? Like right, these, right. These are telling all... us. Yep. Yeah, yeah, no, it's super awesome. I, um, I think that it would be extremely helpful and informative if we can get someone from Genopallet over to chat more about all of this stuff with us in the future. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the, these, uh, they, they were one of the first, obviously, to do it. Um, but there are other companies coming out that are providing even more information than just like, mm-hmm. oh, you're deficient in vitamin A and vitamin D. Like, there are some, some uh, different genes out there that encode for, like, the fact that you're, you, you might be uh, at risk for, heart disease more than someone else or diabetes or maybe uh, even um, you're likely to be at a higher body weight than than someone else. Um, right. And I think that all of these factors um, can be extremely important. I think especially for the performance athlete, you know, there is also genetic information out there to tell you uh, whether you're fast twitch or, uh, mm-hmm. or slow twitch muscle fibers, which is going to sort of point you in the direction of potentially what sport you're like most likely to excel at, you know? So like, it's not about, you know, 
it's not about like okay like look you're not fast twitch you probably right. shouldn't be an olympic weightlifter um but if you could have that information early on like as a child imagine <laughs> everyone would be professional athletes <laughs> yeah if you could have the information like you are most likely to be a fast twitch person and it doesn't matter you just might be interested in long distance running when you get older you'd be a fool to go and be a long distance runner when you're a fast twitch athlete like there are obviously like slow twitch muscle fibers and fast twitch muscle fibers and you can change uh there, there are sort of muscle fibers that are in between right that intermediate you know, muscle fibers Mm -hmm. and different muscle groups that can kind of sway one direction or another based on your training and based on your diet. This is probably has a lot to do with your epigenetics, right? Um, Right. Because you're getting information from proteins and that protein is building muscle and that muscle encodes for a variety of processes that make up our daily lives and activities, right? But Mm -hmm. if you're like a certain percentage of fast twitch and you're born with that certain percentage of fast twitch, you're going to excel and more likely get there faster, you know, on a professional level, for example, if you decided to go into a sport that uses fast twitch muscle fibers, such as Olympic weightlifting, heavy, you know, one rep max, uh, you know, 10 seconds, or, you know, even sprinting 40 seconds, um, et cetera. You know, I think that there are obviously some sports out there where there's a, a bit of a gray area like crossfit like you need to be yeah. able to kind of do both and then mixed martial arts you need to be able to do both um but it's still incredible information to have you know mm-hmm. so i think that there's going to be hopefully a bigger wave where people can get um a lot more access to dna and information about their genetics so that they're able to really optimize not only the what you know, their training and what they're doing, but optimize the selection of the sport that they decide to involve themselves in. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's going to benefit everyone if it's more accessible for both performance standpoint and health standpoint. So hopefully we get there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think, I mean, like, it's only like, Every, every, you know, couple of decades, we see a Michael Jordan or a LeBron James, you know? So, like, right. and there are people out there, like, left stranded and maybe don't even play sports that could be the best in the world. Yeah. And if you could have their DNA and their genes and uh, use that to fa- use a diet to facilitate their training, their recovery, um, and all these other things to elevate performance, I think that that's awesome. And if you don't want to be an athlete... I don't give a shit. You may right. be predisposed to having uh, or, or you know, being at a higher body weight or developing type 2 diabetes. That information is now being provided based right. on your DNA. And you can have a coach or someone out there design a customized diet specifically to make sure that you're, you're managing your body weight appropriately. Uh, a trainer that is providing strength and conditioning or CrossFit programming or any type of programming that's essentially going to tell you what you need to do to stay healthy long term. And this is where like, I feel um, it's not that sellable, you know, it's not like, Mm -hmm. uh, especially on the health side, it's not as sellable as, okay, sir, like, uh, here's metformin. Right. Have a nice day. Like, sorry, we didn't get to you when you were 12 and tell you that you were mm-hmm. predisposed for type 2 diabetes. Um, but here we are. You have it. Um, and yep. here's, your, here's your metformin or whatever the hell they're, they're going to give you. Um, right. But that's how I feel like you put a sort of a sexy twist on it. Like, no, like you're 10 years old. We know what's up. Right. Yeah. And it's possible now. It's definitely possible. It's um, 100% doable, yeah. I think. Yeah, I I agree. I agree completely. I hope that the field goes this way, and I hope more and more nutrition coaches are continuing to to do this. Um, I'm glad that we were able to brainstorm a little bit about the epigenetics and sort of the sort of the the blend of your environment versus what you were born with in terms of uh, genetics. 
Um, are there any other genes that you can think of or things that, uh, you know, are, are becoming important or information that maybe you can find out from your genes that people may not know about? Um, I feel like you can pretty much find out a ton of things from your genes and how they're altered by what, even like something so simple, like tap water can alter your genes and can cause all of these different mechanistic cascades causing potential issues. Um, I don't know if I can dive into all of those genes right now, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, 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 um, it's just good to know that there are more outlets for people to understanding their bodies right. better than, um, than just sitting back and seeing how they feel. Cause that can be extremely subjective mm -hmm. and the mind plays, um, a very important role in people's decisions and how they feel even how they feel about how they look. I look great. Right. I'm getting, you know, I'm getting more fit. I'm doing this, but they're just looking in the mirror. They're not comparing pictures. They're not doing this. With genetics, it really takes out that um, so-called like placebo effect that you play on yourself. Right. You know, like mm -hmm. this. Oh yeah, I'm carb sensitive. You know, you may have just convinced yourself of that, but when the genes come out, they're not they're not fucking lying exactly you know they're not lying um wow so yeah this is obviously a talk one talk of many i think about genes and we can definitely have you back on to talk about um a little bit more of the specifics of maybe each macronutrient and yeah. uh maybe just we focus on performance and stuff like that i think that that would be super helpful and uh, I know our audience and everyone is is really going to enjoy listening to this and they're going to be asking uh, a lot of questions. So if they want to be able to find you, um, either email, Instagram, what, what, what can they do to get in touch with you or even if they want more personal level nutrition coaching from you? Yeah, so they can find me on Instagram at either at Justina dot depuso or at justina marie dot nutrition and even if they want to email me it's j m d a p u z z o at gmail dot com and they could also i don't know sh shoot you a email if they ever get interested too <laughs> yeah yeah uh, for for those of you that didn't know justina is a, a new coach at consistency breeds growth um i've been working uh working on uh, working with lots of individuals over the past five years and it was time that we hired another expert coach to help with the customization so she's been helping us uh, and working with a lot of our athletes and clients so um she is officially a part of the cbg team so you can also contact us at cbg underscore online underscore sports on instagram and uh, or email us at consistencybreedsgrowth at gmail.com or alternatively head over to our website um at consistencybreedsgrowth.com and if you do have any other questions you can reach out to me and we're happy to help you with all your nutrition fitness and optimization of your performance needs that you might have um so justina thanks for coming on today it was a lot of fun um, yeah and we'll definitely have thank to you have so you much on. for having me yeah absolutely um all right guys thanks for listening to the starving podcast go ahead and subscribe uh, in your preferred podcast app on Spotify or Apple, and we'll see you next time. Science.